public plan, hive mind, connecting us all in by law, with microchips in our brains by 2025. We're looking at the literal realization of a military police state in America. The American people have failed in their oversight of the integrity of our political system. The entire economy will be prisons, police in black ski masks, a Nazi Germany-like nightmare. The final target is the American people. We need to break that connection between the police and the military. They're charging people with weapons of mass destruction because they have marijuana. I support the Constitution, which puts me at odds with my own party. There really is an Illuminati. There really are 13 families. They own the big banks and print the money. They're in our universities and they're in our conferences. And they believe in, in one world government. And plunge the American people into the deepest economic abyss of a generation. If we have, or when we have another attack, uh, it, it looks like they'll come with more legislation. Again, problem, reaction, solution. Over and over again, government uses crises to scare the population into submission. That is so important to understand. Topping our news, the approval of a resolution against the Patriot Act by the Austin City Council. The council approved the measure late last night by a vote of 4-3. And before making the decision, council members heard arguments both for and against the law, which gives the government more surveillance powers. Our Veronica Obergon was following the debate and brings us the latest details. It took more than four hours for the city council members to adopt a resolution regarding the Patriot Act. That's because dozens of people signed up to talk on behalf of the act, and at one point the meeting got a bit heated. I personally would like all our children to live in a country where they can have the say and the control over their lives, and not some corrupt government official telling them what they can and cannot do. The USA Patriot Act is unnecessary. It is an insult to Americans. It is an insult to the heritage, to our heritage, and everyone who has worked together to create this country. For the first time in my lifetime, I'm hearing from more and more people who are worried that fascism could indeed happen here. Speakers varied, but opinions towards the Patriot Act rarely did. That is, until we interviewed Assistant U.S. Attorney Ron Siever. The very first thing the Patriot Act does is allows the FBI and the CIA and Department of Justice and other agencies to cooperate with each other and share information so that we can make sure we can spot, identify terrorists, and hopefully prevent Why terrorists. Why have 300 House members then rejected it? But in the middle of our conversation, activist Alex Jones called the assistant attorney a liar. Uh, the Section 802 affects all citizens. It's for all crimes. It's for, it's, for, it's, for, it's for one marijuana cigarette. These guys haven't read it. Have you read it? Hey, can you respect these guys over one second? Well, you know how this stuff works, guys. I'm not going to sit here and hear this guy spew lies. See, this is, they don't want to talk to me. You need to answer real questions. You need to answer real questions instead of lying. And you know, earlier I talked to you, you know it's in Section 802. You know. Wait, can, we, can you guys your title again? Yes, he says the Patriot Act gives law enforcement permission to search homes without warrants. And now under the new Patriot Act, they have sections where they say our officers need not even need these administrative subpoenas or warrants. They can just carte blanche, go anywhere they want for any crime. The status of warrants is the same as it always has been. To do a search of a residence, we have to go to a judge and show probable cause, and a federal judge has to authorize it, and there's no chance. That is not true. It clearly says secret. We will protect liberty at all costs. Hey, guys. That was Veronica Obergon reporting. Meantime, some Central Texans, as you could hear in that piece, are still struggling with the effects of the Patriot Act. More than 600 detainees remain inside the United States military facility at Guantanamo Bay, suspected of involvement in the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and the September the 11th terror attacks. They are in legal limbo, held without charge or trial, and not recognized as prisoners of war. Alex Jones and several folks have tried, or will be donating time to Mr. Jones, Let's, but our rules are they have to be present to do so. Sean Lousen? Is Sean Lousen here? How about Eliza Giles? Eliza? Eliza? Mayor, I had about 20 that we can well, uh, well, in we'll, I know. And, I know 15 is the max. I well, figure we out. You'll see four, four folks will be the max. You'll get there, okay. Mr. Jones. Don't worry about it. Um, All right. Thank De you. Denise Keeper Lousen. Denise Keeper Lousen. Sorry. Uh, Carlos Tame. Okay, Carlos. Okay. Dummy. Yes. Okay. 
How about Mark Wallace? Mark Wallace. Okay. Well, let's see now. Well, that's, so far that's only six of the five people that attempted, Mr. Jones, to give you three minutes. Only two are here. So you have six additional minutes. I'll give you nine. Well, unless, unless somebody else... Mayor, I can go outside and get people. I think folks kind of got... I mean, Are you signed up to speak? Yes, I am. What's your name? Trevor Holly. Trevor Holly? Yes, sir. Okay. I need one more person. What's your name, ma'am? Rebecca. I'm sorry. What's the last name? C-R-E-S-C-I-E-L-O-I. Okay. Okay, so Mr. Jones, you're now at your maximum of 15 minutes. I, will, I just will say, folks, occasionally you'll see um, myself or council members <coughs> leaving the dais. I promise you when we're back uh, in the back, there's a, a television and audio we can hear and see. Oh, so yes, don't, Mayor, don't be, I, I believe you. Don't be offended <laughs> when I leave. I'm not offended. Welcome, Mr. Jones. You have 15 minutes. Well, thank you. And I hope you do stay because this is important. And I want to thank the people that came here that are part of the second American Revolution. We shall prevail. That is a guarantee because, because as the New World Order turns up the heat, they're going to form more resistance. The tighter they squeeze, the more people are going to have that light bulb go off above their head. Now, I believe this council is made up of good people, and I think it's great that uh, Jackie Goodman, Mayor Pro Tem, has brought this forward. Let's go through the facts. And John Ashcroft and Lord Bush and their military industrial complex owners who are setting up a military dictatorship. I mean, this is admitted, PNAC documents, cannot hide the reality of what's happening. In fact, Ashcroft, six months ago, really committed a federal crime. In sworn testimony before the House and Senate, he said there is no new terrorism legislation. It's not been introduced. The Domestic Security Enhancement Act, the Justice Domestic Security Enhancement Act, House and Senate versions. It's like if I got up here and said the sun didn't come up this morning. You'd laugh at me, but the press didn't call him on it. Now he's saying there is a Patriot Act 2 and Victory Act 1 and Victory Act 2 and you better pass all of them. You know what's in Patriot Act 2, Section 501? If you fit the description of a terrorist under Section 802 of the first Patriot Act, you can be arrested and secretly executed. That's right, a three military judge panel. Now what is Section 802 of the first Patriot Act that passed on October 27, 2001? at 5 in the morning when no one was allowed to read it, according to members of Congress. The definition of terrorist is any action that endangers human life that is a violation of any federal or state law. They have many other definitions about anything that influences government. Go read it for yourself. They're counting on you not reading it. They're counting on you not finding it. Ron Paul and others have pointed out that Hitler and Stalin and people didn't have the nerve to put stuff like this down on paper. They just did it. That's what's so amazing about this. And to see the assistant U.S. attorney here uh, peddling this is really sad, but I know it's under orders. Because two months ago, it was reported that Ashcroft met out in Hollywood with the heads, the big editors of all the newspapers, and the heads of law enforcement, and said, we'd like you to go out and write editorials, editors, we'd like U.S. attorneys, assistant attorneys, write editorials, get on talk shows, uh, get out there and sell the... the this is the people, this is good, this is a wonderful thing. So I want the council, in case you don't know this, and the people here today to understand that it's a stage managed event. I mean, it really was hatched in a smoky room to, to oppress you, to manipulate you, to con you. Now that makes me very angry, and that's why it's so exciting that this council may simply just say we have a Bill of Rights and Constitution, and we will not violate the Bill of Rights and Constitution. And in this city, America is still America. I mean, it's just that simple. Now, I'm sure you heard about five years ago about the FBI crime lab. The head of it, Dr. Frederick Whitehurst, who I've interviewed several times, said, I'm not doing this anymore. We've been framing people, manufacturing evidence. This is out of control. I've interviewed FBI agent Tyrone Powers, who talked about how they would frame people, the different criminal things that they would do. Tulia, Texas, 56 black people, no criminal record, no drug paraphernalia, no nothing. On the word of one corrupt cop, gave them all 20 to 90 years in prison. Now you think about that. Houston Crime Lab, thousands framed indiscriminately. The police chief had to admit it because his job's on the line. He's claiming, oh, I'm, I'm going to fix that problem. It's equivalent of Herman Goering 
uh, you know, promising to stop what Hitler was up to. This is amazing, ladies and gentlemen. So this is why we restrict the scope and size of government and its power over us in our lives. Because we know there's criminals on the street, we know there's bad people, but they don't have the massive mechanisms, the machinery of government and military and militarized police and prison complexes to oppress at levels never before seen. Last century, 200 million killed by government. 200 million killed. Millions of American Indians, Native Americans, killed in this country. So don't tell me we, don't, we shouldn't have a concern when the most draconian legislation in the history of the world, dwarfing Byzantine Spain and France, is rolled out against the people. Now, I could list the crimes... I could list the crimes of the FBI, the Defense Department, state police, local police, all day long. My point is, history shows us that we must watch and we must control and we must limit powerful men because power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And I challenge, I challenge members of this distinguished body to be part of history, to not abstain, to get out on the field in your life and you'll truly be alive to not sell out to this corrupt system. You know, I spoke right before Ron Paul just a few weeks ago, right outside Austin. He talked about how his, his poll numbers just go up and up and up, and the support just gets greater and greater and greater as he resists all of this, and as he says no to this, and as he throws the lobbyist out of his office. The truth is, when the whole world's sold out, you guys are going to get more power out of not going with the system. This thing is in terminal velocity. This thing is falling down around itself. The corruption, the comprehensive annual financial reports, the scams. Now, I've got about nine minutes left. I'm going to try to go through these points because they're all very, very important. Section 213 of the First Patriot Act lets them break in your house or any business and take whatever they want or plant whatever they want and not tell you for six months they were there and they're administrative. They're rubber stamps. They aren't for Billy Bob's house because we think he has this under the Fourth Amendment. They're for everybody. They're for whole classes of people. And now under the new Patriot Act, they have sections where they say our officers need not even need these administrative subpoenas or warrants. They can just carte blanche, go anywhere they want for any crime or suspected crime. And the spokesman for the Justice Department just a few months ago, after Ashcroft admitted, okay, there is a Patriot Act too, went before the House of Senate, and this was in the news, in the Associated Press, and said, well, yeah, we're going to use this in all crimes, all drug crimes, everything, misdemeanors, uh, third-degree felonies, everything. That's on the record. U.S. attorneys, deputy attorneys, assistant attorneys, all these people, they're saying, yeah, we're going to use this for everything. They're, they are using it for everything. The Victory Act, which is a continual salvo in this attack on the American people, clearly states that any possession of a controlled substance is an act of terrorism under Section 802, pointing back to that enacting clause, well, it endangers human life. It's a weapon of mass destruction. They've actually got articles in the news about, oh yeah, they're charging people with weapons of mass destruction because they had marijuana. We don't want to be part of this. This is crazy. People disappearing in the middle of the night. I mean, what did Alexander Schultz and Nietzsche say in Gulag Archipelago? Oh, how we burned in the camps later, wishing that when the secret police went out at night to come to our doors, we would have met them. Met them downstairs with pokers and axes and daggers. America is a great country full of great people, and it deserves better than what's happening. And I personally monitor every day the news wires, Reuters, AP, AFP. I spend two hours in the morning, two hours at night, and I have several people that work for me that do the same thing. And I mean, it's, it's well in excess of 400 cities and towns. It's now four states. I mean, it's been in 140, 170 for, what, six months in the news? A more propaganda. Can't the press get anything right? Can't this, control, this controlled corporate whore machine get anything right? <laughs> now, Tenth Amendment, very important subject. During abolition that started in around 1810 or so, there were cities, there were towns, there were states that were free. And they said no to the federal government in the north 
and the government in the South, and they were safe havens for human beings that didn't want to be in bondage and had the courage to flee and risk their lives. It is so American for local governments to stand up to the tyranny of evil men and say no. That is our, that is our place, that is our job. And these arguments, these arguments are baseless and they are the arguments of liars and tyrants and sycophants that beg at the hand of this global cess system. So again, be part of history. Be part of history and stand up and do something right and, 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 and don't abstain. Vote for the Bill of Rights in the Constitution. That shows us how far, how far we've gone, how far we've slid down into the abyss, into the night, into the darkness, that, that it's a radical thing for conservative and liberal cities. Conservative states like Alaska, liberal states like Hawaii. It's radical for them to come out and say, you can't secretly arrest people, you've got to have warrants to bust in houses, it goes on and on. There's this argument, well, our police officers get in trouble not following orders, not, not doing what the feds tell them. The feds, my friends, don't tell the sheriff and the city and the police chief what to do. And that's not debatable. They can try, but it's a fraud. Yeah. And it goes, it goes back. It goes back to the Tenth Amendment time and time again. And it's clear. It's clear. The Nuremberg trials showed this that you do not have to follow an unlawful criminal order. Blow that person's head off and stick them in an oven. No, you don't have to. Torture these Vietnamese women to get answers from them. No, I'm not going to do it. Take this smallpox inoculation. We said so, police officer. 99 plus percent have said no. They're starting to get wise. You can't stop people getting wise. It's happening all over the place. The tyranny's too great. So police, I mean, Police are going to get in trouble, and, and, but the, the problem is the reason they are getting in trouble, and then the feds come in and federalize cities in the name of cause, uh, stopping a problem that they cause, violation of civil liberties and our God-given rights that are enshrined in the first ten amendments to the Constitution. If the police just knew the Constitution, and they taught the Bill of Rights again, and that's why I like this resolution, it talks about that, celebrating a Bill of Rights culture, knowing what our liberties and freedoms are, having workshops for city employees and police, and, 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 and having a trust again in the community. That's what we need, and that's all we're asking you to do, is to do something right and stand up for humanity. Now, there's a lot of talk about democracy here this evening and it's very important to understand that we're a country that has a rule of law and in a democracy a pure democracy if uh, when the Greeks would tally up the stones they'd say okay we're gonna kill this guy because we don't like what he's been saying the majority says so and they'd go throw him off a cliff and a lot of the great philosophers it's two wolves and a sheep voting on what's for dinner <laughs> that's what a democracy is we need a republic which is a limited democracy where, where, just because, where just because a bunch of people under fear when the dictator is carrying out terrorist attacks to scare the people into submission can't stampede off the cliff and round up Arabs or Muslims or Christians or people's land they want. That's what freedom's all about is protecting everybody. And that's what our beautiful republic does. So please, this is a big step. This is standing up and saying no to this tyranny. This is not just some uh, you know, frivolous resolution that does nothing. This is historical people all over the country coming together and rediscovering their liberties and freedoms and interfacing with their local government and saying, hey, be part of this solution so that we can have a safe and happy and vibrant community where people can grow and live and learn. Now, it, it really is important also for the council and for the people assembled here today to understand that the level of deception and manipulation and skullduggery surrounding the Patriot Act's passage, surrounding the introduction of Patriot Act II, Victory Act I and II, all of the arm twisting and, 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 and garbage that's gone on in Washington, D.C., that is all the more reason the lies by the Justice Department and their minions telling us that it doesn't affect citizens, telling us that we don't have anything to worry about. 
it demands that we stand up and speak out and repudiate this nightmare legislation. I mean, it's it, it just there's darkness swirling around this thing. And as more of the veils are pulled away, we see the true horror of what they're trying to build, what they're trying to construct. And I'll just close with this. And it is scary, and we need to be scared. So we can get involved and stand up. That's what fear is about. Getting you moving, not hiding under the pillow, not hiding under the bed. General Rick Baucus, you should have heard about in the States, but of course you didn't. Brigadier General over Camp X-Ray resigned. He said, I'm not going to be part of torturing these people. These aren't even Taliban or Al-Qaeda at this pace. This is all a big show. And he left. You, did you ever hear the head general said, I'm not going to torture these little kids? Well, most of them are like 12. That's sick, folks. And nobody even knows about that. Nobody even knows about that. That's Associated Press. That's the reality of what we're dealing with and facing. So I'm asking the people of this council, the citizens of Austin, to join us and to do the right thing and, again, to be part of history. Please do it. Do the right thing. Please don't abstain. Please vote and reaffirm the Bill of Rights and Constitution and the soul and heart of America. And, again, I want to thank all of you for being here. Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney is an unusual person. She's spoken out against the United Nations and its child kidnapping rings involve a dine corps. Uh, she came out against uh, President Bush on September 11th and said that there was evidence of prior knowledge and that there should be a real investigation that wasn't going to be run by Henry Kissinger. Talk about a weasel guarding the fox at the hen house. Uh, and I was in San Francisco at an award ceremony for Project Censored. I'd gotten second place uh, for my analysis of the Patriot Act in the magazine Global Outlook put out by the Global Research Group. And uh, what was really interesting is after her speech, after the award ceremony, she ran up and hugged me. And she said, oh, Alex Jones, Alex Jones. And I didn't know that she even knew who I was. And she said, yeah, your film, Road to Tyranny, woke me up woke me up to the New World Order. She went on to say that uh, your footage of Oklahoma City and the prior knowledge and the government involvement is amazing. And of course I'm saying to my camera guy, get over here, get over here, get over here. Uh, and then we talked to her some on camera and she repeated about the UN, the white slavery rings and about the documentary film and uh, how powerful it was for her. But for me it's an example of what one guy in Austin, Texas can do. Because I know the Dixie Chicks have, have uh, admitted that they woke up to the fakeness of the war because of Road to Tyranny. Uh, I know that uh, Congresswoman McKinney woke up to 9-11 because of my film, at least partly. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of prominent people um, have, have, have woken up. How many just average folks out there who are just as important as these people have, ha have been awakened? And it shows what one person can do. So here's some excerpts of Congresswoman McKinney's speech, uh, my discussion with her, uh, then myself receiving the award and a short speech I gave about the New World Order. And then we'll uh, also get us some excerpts of a discussion we had with Frank Morales, uh, who is an Episcopal priest in New York, who has written some of the most in-depth analysis that I've seen about the martial law roundup plans, the end of posse commentatus, moving into this prison-style economy. So here's Frank Morales um, exposing the police state, Congresswoman McKinney, and of course myself at the Project Censored Awards for 2004. I want to welcome you to the 27th Annual Project Censored Awards Ceremony. Please welcome Cynthia McKinney. I have just one question. Who are we and who's responsible for what we've become? As I survey the landscape of the changes that have taken place literally before my eyes over the course of my lifetime, I have to wonder, where did we go wrong? George W. smirks, Dick Cheney sneers, Rumsfeld jokes, Powell blusters, Rice lies, Enron and WorldCom steal, DynCorp vaccinates, Halliburton feeds and feeds and feeds and feeds. Americans hurt, and in Iraq, Americans die. Our national leaders insult our allies, create more foes, reward their friends, increase our insecurity through their own policies, and plunge the American people into the deepest economic abyss of a generation. 
massive failures all around us enter into the calculation in any answer to my question, who are we and who's responsible for what we've become? From the lies to our service men and women and to all of us about Iraq, to the still unanswered questions about September 11th, the Congress has failed in its oversight of the executive branch and the American people have failed in their oversight of the integrity of our political system. It's horrible that Rumsfeld can say America can afford the extra $87 billion for corporate outrage and human cannon fodder in Iraq while at the same time, women and children constitute the fastest growing segment of our homeless population. The very act of our sitting vice president taking a paycheck, I can't even believe I'm saying this, taking a paycheck from the American people while at the very same time taking one from a corporation that gets billions and billions of dollars in no bid sole source contracts should make us all outraged and the vice president should blush. But these people don't blush because in the end, they know they can get away with it. We also now know that the administration has kept many secrets from the American people, including changing a September 11th ground zero environmental impact statement in order to speed up the opening of Wall Street. They've lied to us on Iraq. They still haven't told us what they knew and when they knew it about the tragic events of September 11th. And yet, they have intimidated the poor 9-11 victims' families into giving up their right to sue the perpetrators and the supporters who helped carry out the 9-11 attacks. That's why my last piece of legislation allowed the September 11th families to participate in a government compensation fund and sue and thereby find the truth for all of us on what actually happened on that day. I believe the promise of our country was stolen two generations ago in bold and brazen acts of violence. Sniper's bullets took that America away from us. And, and almost in rapid succession, bullets took Martin and Bobby from us too. It came to my attention during my last days in Congress that Bobby was considering Dr. Martin Luther King to be his running mate. Now imagine the America we might have had. But when confronted with evil back then, what did we do? Not too far away from this very place. Mario Savo of Berkeley's free speech movement told us what to do. Mario Savo told us that sometimes when the machine becomes so odious, it makes us sick. And at that point, we have to put our entire bodies against the gears and the wheels and the levers, against the entire apparatus, and we have to make it stop. And that we have to say to those who own the machine that unless we're free, will prevent the machine from working at all. There's a time when the operation of the machine becomes so odious, makes you so sick at heart, that you can't take part. You can't even passively take part. And you've got to put your bodies upon the gears and upon the wheels, upon the levers, upon all the apparatus, and you've got to make it stop. And you've got to indicate to the people who run it, to the people who own it, that unless you're free, the machine will be prevented from working at all. Who are we and who's responsible for what we've become? America is us, and we're responsible for what we've become. If we answer in any other way, 
we're content to have others define us, even others who have proven to us that they can't be trusted. A young teacher recently asked me what did I think she could do to advance the cause of people who think like us. I told her that the greatest gift my teachers had given me was the ability to think. Teaching our young people how to think is the greatest gift our teachers can give, for it's the independent thinkers who will save our country. So my hat's off to the professors at Simona State for even conceiving such a program and to the university for being committed to it. Project Censored ensures that our country will have a cadre of young people trained to think. And for those of us who care enough about our country to find out what's going on, Project Censored makes it easier for us to know so that we can make for our country a better tomorrow. Thank you to the journalists for writing the stories that you've written. Thank you for inviting me to participate. And thank you, Seven Stories. Thank you. It was amazing meeting you. You say you saw my video, Road to Tyranny? I saw your video. It's absolutely wonderful. And what's so good about it and irrefutable about it is that you use original footage. And what I, through my experience with working with COINTELPRO and the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., I can tell you that the one thing that they don't want in the hands of the people is the original footage because then people like you can go back and dissect exactly what happened, exactly what was said, exactly who said it and at what time they said it. And that's exactly what you did. And so um, the credibility that you give to your argument by using their own words and their own timeline is phenomenal. So. You did all of us a tremendous service by giving us the documentation that you did. Well, we're talking to uh, Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, and, and, I, and I'm not just saying this, I'm on the radio I've said it many times, you're one of the few people that had a wide range of understanding in legislation. And you spoke out about so many issues, whenever it was about freedom or liberty, wasn't a Republican or Democrat issue. No, you stood all. up, which is why the establishment obviously targeted you among just uh, only a handful of others in the last decade. They had to get out of there. Uh, what would you say to others out there about getting involved and making a difference? Well, there's one thing that's for sure. If you don't get involved, you'll never make a difference. But by getting involved, I believe we still can make a difference. It now is not the time for us to give up on our political system. And we're here in California. On October 7th, there is going to be a result. Now, there can be some people who choose not to suit up that day, choose not to participate in the game that'll be played, but they'll have to live under whatever the regime is that comes to power on October 7th. In 2004, in November, there's going to be an election and there's going to be an outcome. Now, for people who can say, who want to say, well, we don't have confidence in the system. We don't have confidence that our votes are going to be counted. That's all the more reason to participate more heavily. And investigate. And investigate, In fact, absolutely. before the camera was on, I was talking about Dybald and these companies, and they, they found them bragging that we'll deliver uh, votes to Bush, and, and, and we're going to manipulate things. This has been actually... In different regional newspapers, it's coming out, but the average person isn't aware. You were telling me about a Tennessee case of uh, some election fraud. A Tennessee case that was uh, mentioned to me by Judge Joe Brown, who's on television now, television judge. But there was a case in Tennessee where the tabulation software added illegally a quarter of a vote to the favored candidate for every one vote that the unfavored candidate received. Now, that was flat out wrong. But because this particular unfavored candidate had Judge Joe Brown on his side, they were able to sue and find out exactly what happened. So we understand that these manipulations are going to take place. So they're even, they're even computerizing the paper ballots already, what you're saying? This was prior to the touch screen. And so this, you're absolutely right. This is with the paper ballot. That is scary, and now they want to get rid of even the paper ballot so there's no record. That sounds perfect for George Bush. Well, 
George Bush isn't the only person we have to fear. It's the system itself and those who feed at the public trough, they are the ones that we now have to fear. And that knows no party, knows no color, knows no class. I mean, um, the only thing that's going to save us are people like you, the activists who are here, the independent journalists who are willing to search for the truth and take it to the American people no matter where it ends. Congresswoman, uh, this is just amazing. I read your full press release and quote about 9-11 on my radio show. And, and I have a conservative and a liberal audience, it's just Americans. All you said is we have bus accidents or train wrecks and we have investigations, but there shouldn't be one about the biggest terrorist attack in U.S. history. And then the media didn't take your quotes, they just attacked you on lies. Yes. And just, I've never seen such a demonization campaign. Then I saw the polls, the Atlanta Journal-Constitution was going your way and they, and they pulled it. Can you talk about both those issues? How trained professional journalists can get a story so wrong is a mystery to me. And so I have to believe that th they got it wrong, not by accident, but because there was a desire to get the story wrong, that demonization that you were talking about. And it was interesting that when the Atlanta Constitution put the poll, the people poll up on the internet, and people agreed with my position, you're absolutely right. They yanked it, they stopped it, they yanked it from the internet and said, okay, the poll is over. So we understand that there are a lot of people out there in America's heartland who think just like we do, who have seen the, the outrageous behavior starting with the Florida election and then uh, declining from there of this administration and understand intuitively that something is wrong. They may not understand exactly what, but they know that something is wrong. We're on the wrong track. And of course, only these uh, recent revelations about uh, the uh, lies, basically, the deceptions with, that put our young men and women in harm's way in Iraq and they're stationed all over the globe and they're getting sick and For they've Dick got... Dick Cheney's bank account. <laughs> well, Dick Cheney isn't the only one who's making a whole lot of money. You've got DynCor that's got a sole source contract to provide vaccines for the Pentagon and DynCor is the corporation whose employees were over in Bosnia and, and uh, Middle Europe at buying and selling little girls. So why should they be rewarded with a contract to provide vaccines to our young men and women in the, in the, uh, who are soldiers and now our soldiers are getting sick with this mystery illness and we don't know why. Folks, you can see why they are afraid of Cynthia McKinney. And no matter what party you're in, you need to get behind people like her. It is my great honor to present several awards this evening to four outstanding writers for their hard work and who continue to shed light on an otherwise dark media. Story number two, Homeland Security Threatened Civil Liberties, was fir first brought to our attention by Alex Jones, originally featured on Infowars.com, Rents.com, and Global Outlook, Volume 4. Also, Frank Morales, published in Global Outlook, Winter 2003, I want to thank Project Censored. I had uh, read several volumes over the years and gotten a lot of great guests from our syndicated radio show and for what we do at InfoWars.com and PrisonPlanet.com. And one of the last speakers talked about, it's not George Bush, it's not Dick Cheney. They are. They're Aaron boys, they're puppets for the military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned us about. And let me tell you something, these people have said Rand Corporation and others have said the entire economy will be prisons, police in black ski mask, a Nazi Germany-like nightmare. It makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up to talk about it, to read what's in Patriot Act 1 and 2, to see what Homeland Security does, Victory Act 1 and 2. We have got to get the word out now. We have got to warn everybody because this military industrial complex and their PNAC and their NORTHCOM plans state that they will carry out the terror, that they will engineer the crises so they can offer their solution.
It's been done throughout history. The good news is that right in my hometown of Austin, Texas, we just threw out the Patriot Act. It's over 400 cities. It's over 400 cities. It's not 170. It's not 250. It's over 400 cities and towns. That's being censored. It's now three states with about three or four others about to repudiate it. We have a Bill of Rights culture, a liberty culture growing, and across the board, in radio interviews I do and on my own syndicated show, liberals, conservatives, black, white, old, young, they know it's tyranny. They know George Bush wants to be a dictator, and people are waking up everywhere. So be part of history. Everybody out there watching, be part of history. Educate yourselves on the facts. Research the truth, and then get out there and speak out to everyone in your community about history, that powerful men and powerful people want more control, and it's happening again, and it can happen in America. If we don't do this, we're delivering our children and our culture and our society into the pit of a New World Order global system of complete tyranny. And if America falls, the rest of the world will be swallowed by this neo-fascism that will make Brave New World in 1984 look like a cakewalk. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you for standing up against tyranny. Infowars.com. Uh, uh, my name is Frank Morales. I'm from Lower East Side, New York. I'm a squatter since 1985, an Episcopal priest. Um, I wrote a piece for Global Outlook magazine entitled Pentagon Declares War on America, uh, which dealt with, uh, I meant that literally, which deals with under the operations other than war doctrine um, and the uh, consolidation of the military and the police within America with the imminent repeal of the Posse Comitatus Act. Uh, just this past week there was uh, more talk of that, which will completely eliminate any distinction between the police and the military in America, the institutionalization of NORTHCOM, um, a domestic military command which is uh, celebrating its one year um, anniversary this past week. Um, we're looking at, uh, you know, what Alex was referring to, which is, uh, you know, the literal, um, you know, realization of a military police state in America. The war on terrorism, particularly in its homeland defense manifestation, is a, is a thin cover for the war on dissent. Um, homeland defense, I wrote a piece for covert action in 99 because the euphemism of Homeland Defense was being tossed around at the Pentagon at that time. At that time, Homeland Defense was very clearly about civil disturbance suppression, growing out of an extension of the garden plot operation. We can't uh, get bogged down and get paranoid about these things, but we have to take action. In New York City right now, we're forming um, a group which is about demilitarizing the police uh, in preparation for the RNC convention in August. Now, what, what we mean by that is to examine the ways in which the, the uh, police acquire so-called non-lethal weapons through the public contracts, a recodification of posse comitatus locally, um, and various other means that we can preempt their ability to preempt us. So we need to get involved in some concrete actions so we can push these things back. Okay, all power to the imagination. Thank you. Yes. We're talking to a grassroots activist, Frank Morales, who has an incredible grasp on this infrastructure, this web of control that's been put in place by the military industrial complex. Part of their plan to use crises, whether it's the drug war or the war on terror, to convince the general public to accept giving up liberty for security. Mr. Morales, thanks for talking to us. Okay. Time and time again, we see these pretexts for control. There's a crisis, we've got to take your freedom so we can keep you safe. But when you investigate it, when I've investigated it, it always leads back to these private corporations that sit as parasitic organisms above the mechanisms of government. Solutions, Frank Morales, in your years of study, to countering that. How do you counter that politically? And number one, how do you break the conditioning of the general public out there that's in kind of a mesmerized state? Well, one of the things that I think we need to rely on is, uh, you know, the fact that there's a long tradition in America separating the military from the police. Um, George Washington, for instance, you know, refused kingship, um, you know, was, was, was offered this title, um, but refused to take on that role, um, suggesting that you know, it was not uh, right for uh, a movement in those days that was about 
um, opposing the uh, state, you know, the, the quartering of soldiers in people's houses and so forth. It was an anti-militarism that sort of founded this country and, and the separation between the military and the police is kind of the, the foundation upon which our democracy is built. So I think one of the things that people need to look at is the ways in which that we can recodify the Posse Comitatus Act. The, the Posse Comitatus Act being the criminal statute which bars the military from enforcing laws domestically. One of the things that we're trying to do in New York City right now, along with the Bill of Rights Defense Committees, which are popping up around the country right now, is to recodify Posse Comitatus locally so that we can begin to break the, the connection between the militarization of the police and the, uh, the, the kind of transfers of technology, non-lethal weapons and so forth that's coming into, the, into uh, local police forces. Right now we're looking at a thousand or more SWAT units around the country. Um, we're looking at drug pretexts for Waco. Waco was, was ostensibly a drug operation which allowed for the involvement of Delta Force and other military forces. So there's a connection between this war on drugs and any number of situations in which uh, you know, the civil liberties and the rights of American citizenry are, are being threatened and undermined right now. We go out in the communities around Austin and these are old communities in the 1830s, 1840s, yeah. happy little communities and, and they go, us and all our neighbors have been raided by the army. Yeah. And they'll have the army with them with helicopters in support with men cussing and yelling and screaming at children and, and nothing's found. And they get mad. Right. It, it, it's like they're raiding a Viet Cong village or something. Exactly. At the recent uh, few years back, I'm sure you're familiar there with the urban warrior um, war game scenarios that the Pentagon was carrying out around the country. Oakland and everywhere. Yeah, they were doing them all over the place. And in some cities, um, they were thrown out. Uh, there was a town in Texas, I don't remember, Kingsville, I think it was, where they had a three-day... Uh, we were there. Buildings had, on fire. Right, they had right. foreign troops with them. Yeah, and then I think it was the mayor of Charlottesville, uh, I guess that's in North Carolina, South yes, Carolina, um, actually, uh, you know, protested the involvement, the, the, you know, of, of the military in this training exercise and had them thrown out of town. Um, so in, in that case, the, the, uh, the Chief people... Chief of Police in San Antonio, too. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, but these exercises are thinly disguised, uh, you know, uh, 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 civil, uh, you know, civil disturbance suppression Con exercises. Con you know? Conditioning mechanisms. Yeah, they're getting people used to the involvement of, of the military. They, you know, when you have Bush, <coughs> literally this week as we're speaking, we're, we're in the first week of October 2003, getting ready to repeal Posse Comitatus Act. Um, thereby, you know, eliminating any distinction between the military and the police. I mean, they're not talking about getting us used to it. They're talking about a complete consolidation of the military so that, and the police so that military people will be able to search your home, will be able to arrest you legally. Um, under the, with the weakest of pretenses, in the case of New York, the, you know, oh, sorry, we broke in. The woman died of a heart attack, Mrs. Sproul. Um, yeah, well, that's a horrible case, but yeah. I see cases scanning news wires every week where it's the wrong house and they shoot some old guy or some young boy right. in the back and say, well, collateral damage is the war on drugs. Exactly. And then you catch the CIA shipping the trash in to begin with, right. and they bust some cartel that didn't pay them their cut. Exactly. It seems to me one of the things holding back this fascist system from coming into full fruition is that they don't have enough sociopaths. They don't have enough gung-ho people that will carry out the type of mass oppression that they've put down in their blueprints and their plans. Comments? Well, one thing that comes to mind is uh, after the Second World War, there were studies done on the uh, firing rates of the soldiers, which showed that most soldiers would not shoot at another human being, even if they were directly threatened, um, that they had a predisposition not to kill. So to make a long story short, by the time of Vietnam, the manner in which soldiers were trained um, has shifted to a form of operant conditioning. It's no, so marksmanship is no longer uh, little ducks uh, on, a, on, a, pond, you know, on a, a modified pond that you knock over and uh, whatever on, on a fence. It's video simulation, um, room, video rooms that you walk into and it, it, they develop a quick shoot reflex. Um, in New York City right now, the NYPD has a contract and so does the LAPD with Firearms Training Systems Incorporated, based in Sewanee, Georgia. Firearms Training Systems Incorporated uh, not only trains the LAPD in marksmanship and the NYPD using operant condition, uh, uh, so on, but also trains the Marines, also trains uh, militaries around the world. Firearms Training Systems, until recently, was headed up by Peter Marino, who comes out of the uh, um, Central Intelligence Agency um, the, the unit of this, uh, the, the sector of Central Intelligence Agency, which was responsible for MKUltra. 
So it's a psychological, um, uh, um, you know, uh, molding psychologically uh, the personnel who are involved in police agencies to develop quick shoot reflexes. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an attempt to uh, socialize and to, to create a psychological mechanism within the soldiers so that they can more easily kill. You're talking about switching off the thinking process. Exactly. Hitler, fact, Hitler talked a lot about that. In fact, in, the, in New York City, in, during the Diallo trial, because um, people ask, why is it that the, uh, the, the, four, the, the cops who ostensibly, you know, shot um, Diallo 41 times, how could they possibly have gotten a, off, right? If you examine the details of that trial, which I did, the, they got off according to the, to the judge and according to the, to the various testimonies that were made because they were not thinking when they did it. They were acting on their training. Firearms training system in their brochure, which the NYPD has a contract, in their brochure they say, firearms training system, uh, having a contract with us, also gives you uh, 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 protection uh, against liability for, against the use of excessive force. It says that in their brochure. But we need to point out that there is an inherent contradiction between democracy and militarism. Um, that militarism can only lead to an increase of violence all around. So that we, can need, we need to be very specific about the ways in which we go about it. Some of the things we're doing in New York now is to identify, for instance, the contracts that the NYPD has with various non, so-called non-lethal contractors. Non-lethal weaponry is a booming industry right now. And whether it's rubber bullets, electromagnetic pulse weapons, which are being ready to be utilized on the streets right now, which heat skin to 130 degrees from 200 yards away. This weapon exists. It's, it, they're ready to bring it out. Um, we need to break that connection between the police and the military, that, which is what's happening now. Bush's people are ready to repeal Posse Comitatus, uh, the Posse Comitatus Act, which is the criminal statute that delineates the police from the military. Literally this week, they're ready to repeal that. Isn't so, that the key uh, to what they're doing is that you have the military industrial complex that owns the dominant media. Right. And now they just want to go into business here domestically. I mean, we got Lockheed Martin running the red light cameras. We've got them involved putting in the surveillance cameras. We've got a host of other defense complex uh, country uh, uh, companies now involved with the prison industry at every level, integrating and funding the, the campaigns of politicians. Simply put, I would say we have a criminal syndicate, an enterprise <laughs> that's been sophisticated enough to get control of the media and the government, and they're going to enslave almost every last one of us. They're, right. they're never going to stop because all their subdirectors are, are going to want to expand their, quote, productivity, and their productivity is tyranny and net destruction of humanity and creativity and family yeah. and community. <laughs> well, once you create a, uh, an equation between profit-making and armaments, between uh, you know, creating the weapons to suppress uh, dissent in America, whether it's electromagnetic pulse weaponry or rubber bullets or gases or psychotronic gases which are now being field tested. Um, once you create that, that, that symbiosis between profits and, 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 and these weapons, that's a dangerous situation. This is what I, Eisenhower pointed out years ago in, in warning about this military industrial complex. The thing we need to do um, as a citizenry is to do what we did back in the days of the Revolutionary War, is to identify militarism as the enemy and to go at it, um, even whether it's locally to, to disarm the SWATs, you know, we're talking about a thousand SWAT units around the country right now. This is the people's money that's being put to use in buying this weaponry. The people need to get inside of these police stations and implode them from inside. They need to go in, identify ways in which they can disarm the police in, in these contexts, to recodify posse comitatus locally, in other words, to, to, to enforce the distinction between the military and the police. Um, they need to propagandize the police. So it goes oh. back to education. Right. We have to be force multipliers, special forces leaders for liberty and freedom right. in our communities to go in and speak some sense and some dignity to these people. And I've done this, and I've preached this to my viewers and listeners, and, and, and we've seen change. Look at the 400-plus cities exactly. that have passed laws against the Patriot Act and Homeland Security. Look at the states that have done it. Look at the massive resistance that has formed against this, which is being ignored by the dominant press, right. and that's only fanning it. So just amazing points from uh, Frank Morales and to everybody out there, you are leaders. We can't do it all for you. And you have to educate yourself on these facts. You have to get out there and reach out to people and understand that history is repeating itself. And uh, you probably don't have a choice. I mean, I mean, it's not much of a choice to be a slave or be free. I know you're going to want to stand up 
for liberty, for freedom, and uh, get involved. And what Frank's talking about, these thousand plus SWAT teams, these multi-jurisdictional task forces, these are federally funded, federally controlled, and the media is there hyping it up like it's, you know, the new uh, savior, you know, that only real men are members of this. Right. They're selling us this. Certainly you can see the propaganda they're foisting upon us, their lies, and you may think, well, that's so much power, such a massive structure of media, we can't counter that. But they have to reapply their lies continually. We show somebody a lie once, we take the curtain away from their eyes once, <laughs> they're out on their own for forever going and researching and waking up others. And that's where our power lies. We have so much power, but it's up to you to become those leaders. Can you speak uh, to those out there, Frank, about becoming yeah. leaders and getting involved? Yeah, I would say that, you know, the, uh, the, the pyramid, you know, the power is derived from the, fed, from the feds. It's a, it's an, it's a, a rampant executive, uh, you know, mindlessness. Um, uh, the, the federal, uh, you know, um, police and military entities Looking to you know, uh, you know, just completely erode our civil liberties on the on the base. But at the bottom of the pyramid, that's where the strength is. And as long as people are become aware of these situations and begin to move in in very kind of distinct and, and rational ways, and understand, for instance, what I was talking about, identifying within your local police departments ways in which you can demilitarize those police departments. There's no reason that you can't create a SWAT watch in your town. There's no reason that we can't begin to identify what contracts do these local police departments have with the companies that are selling them these weapons and begin to get a hold of those funds. Um, defund these, op these uh, police institutions to the extent that they're uh, um, you know, contracting with these, these uh, groups and getting these weapons which they're going to be using against you. We need to preempt uh, their ability to preempt our, our right to, uh, to, to protest to have uh, you know have our grievances redressed and uh, you know and in order to exercise our freedom, there is an inherent contradiction between democracy and militarism, and whether or not uh, you know we are left, right, or center, everyone should be concerned that the increasing level of violence on the grassroots, these rampant SWAT uh, uh, you know uh, units around the country, the ways in which Posse Comitatus Act, which uh, you know denies the military to enforce laws domestically, is being eroded and is threatening to be repealed right now. Um, these are things that we can organize campaigns around. So I would suggest that people just get educated around these, uh, these issues and, uh, and take hope and, and fight back. You're about to see some really important clips, sections of a speech that Colonel Craig Roberts gave in Kansas City at a presentation I was putting on in 2003. Colonel Craig Roberts was a highly decorated Marine Corps sniper in Vietnam and subsequently wrote a best-selling book, One Shot, One Kill, uh, detailing what happened there. Later in life, he became a member of Army Intelligence. Uh, he also worked as a detective uh, on the Tulsa, Oklahoma Police Department and worked the Oklahoma City bombing case. Colonel Roberts is an expert on the New World Order, and his insights give us a view into the mind of the globalist thinkers and to many aspects of the crimes they've committed. Here's Colonel Roberts. Where are we at now? The final target is the American people. And who benefits on the Hegelian principle member who created a fear of attack pass a stronger anti-terrorism bill every time. Now, the way it works out, the difference between communism and Fabian socialism is communism says, kick in the door, shove a gun in their face, and tell them, be a communist or die. Real quick. Fabian socialism says, knock on the door and put one foot in the living room, talk your way into putting the second foot in the living room until you own the whole house. You do it by legislating your way there a little bit at a time. It's called the frog in the pot. It's called incrementalism. It's called the inchworm effect, where the inchworm feels out. If it feels resistance, it backs up and moves around the object. Uh, incrementalism is, I come to you and I say, I want to take all of your house. And you say, you can't have all my house, but I'll let you stay in my front yard. I'll compromise. Okay, that's fair enough. A week later, I want your front porch. I'm not going to give you my front porch, but you can have the steps, see? This is what happens when we get at the national level in Washington, D.C., for those of you who haven't figured it out yet, the National Democratic Party was taken over by the Communist Party of the USA back in the 1960s. They infiltrated their members to the very top, and they have Fabian Socialists there, okay? And they've got a few Stalinists, but mostly Fabian Socialists that want to incrementalize our way into globalism and the New World Order and all of this. The Republican Party, uh, and it's mass confusion, probably has a few in there too, but I think mainly they're just dumb because they haven't figured it out yet, or if they figured it out, they go along with the flow anyway. But the Republican Party's deal is, 
we had to compromise. Remember that all through the Clinton administration, every time they wanted to pass some obscene law, the, uh, the Republicans say, well, we had to compromise with the Brady Bill. We had to compromise and meet him halfway. No, you don't ever compromise. We didn't send you there to compromise. We sent you there to say no, to draw a line in the sand. You don't compromise. Because compromise allows the enemy to advance at least halfway. And they ask for the rest tomorrow. So the Hegelian effect is, you don't want to do it. You don't want to compromise, so we're going to make you want to do it with brain, uh, with mind control, and we're going to do it by scaring you and telling you it's going to hurt your kids, it's going to hurt you, whatever. They create a scenario, and you buy off on it. So we end up with uh, stronger anti-terrorism bills, we, which are basically anti-constitution, and run around the Constitution. We've got uh, prohibit the private ownership of guns eventually. Right now, the Ninth Circuit's already come out and said that gun ownership is not an individual right. It's a privilege given by the government. Folks, there's a big difference between rights and privileges. Privileges are given by uh, the government. Rights are something you have they can't take away. And they're trying to redefine which is which. And they're trying to move the gun rights into the gun privileges. And we can't let them do that. Somebody asked me once, well, Roberts, what's your, what's your tripwire? What's your line in the sand? When do you actually do more than just speak? Well, I'll tell you what, if I ever see a Chinese guy driving down my road with a blue hat, he's gonna wish he didn't come there. <laughs> now, I may be slow, and I may be old, and maybe I don't see as far as I used to, but I got a heck of a good trigger finger. Okay, prohibit private ownership of guns, establish a national ID system for what? For tracking purposes. They can't control people if they don't know who they are and where they're at. You've got to identify everybody before and register them before you can control them. And they've got to make more, and it's really hard for them to do this, but it's real easy for you to be convinced that they've done it. I.e., oh, I've got a social security number, they can find me anywhere. I've got a driver's license number, they can find me anywhere. I've got this, they can find me anywhere. Wrong answer, it's like trying to drink water out of a fire hose. Get up on an airplane, look down at the city and try to figure out how you're gonna track all those people with all the computers in the world, it ain't gonna be done. It can't be done. Over a period of time, they'll find you, okay? They have ways of doing that. If you spend money, if you do anything, yeah, if you try to move from one place to another eventually. I mean, property taxes alone. I mean, everybody registers their property, you know, unless you live in a tent in the back of a park someplace. Uh, so, why run? And why care? Stand up and say, hey, the buck stops here, the line's in the sand, and you got a problem with me, let's just, let's just get it fixed. And if everybody did that, Alexander Solzhenitsyn said this, when the organs came in the middle of the night, if we'd met them in the stairwells with clubs and with knives, sooner or later they would run out of agents and we would not have gone to the gulags. Establish a national police force. They're doing that right now by cross-deputizing all of the police. Uh, and these young officers out there, you gotta remember, police officers are good guys. The problem is we're getting a young bunch in there to come out of the public school system to go through the socialist college system. Why does a police officer have to have a college degree? Because it puts him in socialist, left-wing college classrooms. And they say, if you have a degree in sociology, that's fine for the police department. Or, of course, you can be a lawyer or you can be, you know, they give you some other choices. You know, if you come out of there and you've got a degree in horseshoeing or something, obviously that's not going to work. But they want you to have something like that. Well, what does that do? That builds a base of young recruits. Someday guys like me who, uh, you know, have our head above the water are gone and the young ones, young ones come up and they're into this, guns are bad, the new world order and globalism is good, and I get to be a federal agent with a cross-deputy deal, isn't this cool? And they're paying me more money because I got a college degree. It's a mind control deal for the young. And when the young, older officers are gone and we can't explain to them, we got some problems here and we need to talk about things like what does the Constitution say that you took an oath to, like Jack McLam does to them, then I don't know what's going to happen. So I deal with officers all the time. I stay in contact with them. I drop by the lodge. I visit them. I stop in the street you know, and talk to them. Of course, they all know who I am. I'm kind of a legend in my own mind over there. But um, in, my, in my nick of the woods. But that's all you can do. You do what you can do. That's all, ex that's all you're expected to do. Let me tell you something. Don't sit there taking the information and do nothing. If you want to be, I'm a patriotic couch potato, then you're wasting your time and mine too. Okay? You've got to educate at least one or two other people and they need to do the same thing. America is the last bastion. The globalists know that to establish an effective global government, no private individuals can be permitted to own or bear private firearms. There must be no chance of resistance or rebellion. The population of every country on the planet must be disarmed, followed by their police forces and local military organizations. 
The National Guard's going to get disarmed. The police are going to get disarmed. And how do we know this? It's happened in the, all over the whole world, and we're the last ones left. Do you know who the only populations that have guns left besides us? Iraqis, PLO, Libyans, terrorist organizations. Now, when only the terrorists have guns, what is that going to mean? Okay? So, the biggest thing is, if we meekly do what the Aussies and the New Zealanders and the Brits and the Canadians have done, we deserve what we get. They're going to legislate the gun, guns away by fear, create fear by using the events in the media, have legislation ready to pass that reduces or eliminates firearms in the hands of the citizens. How many can you own? How, how big are the magazines? Pretty soon it's going to be single shot. Then it's going to be, we got to get rid of certain categories and classes of weapons. How about the multiple projectile weapon of mass destruction? The shotgun. How about the preferred weapon of the assassin? The 22. How about the sniper class weapons? Anything with a scope on it? Pretty soon you got them all. Boy, what a nice crowd. This is pretty neat. And I actually got applause for an introduction. That's, I don't even get that in Washington. <laughs> Go to Washington again and I just, just barely get by, you know. But, uh, but it is real nice to be here. And it's nice to be at home. It's nice to be in Texas. And uh, basically all of August I've been here. And uh, it's very encouraging. You know, in Washington, if you think that the world uh, is uh, what we see and hear and do in Washington, you know, you have a really a distorted viewpoint about what America's all about. So it's when I come home and get to visit and get to speak out and get to visit with people like you that I realize that there are some very deep concerns about what's happening in this country and that you're on the right track and that you want to do what's right and you're not coming to the government and looking for handouts and special interests. So that to me uh, is very encouraging and there is but one special interest that we should be working for and that would solve just about all of our problems and that is our liberty. So often in Washington, that is the issue that is uh, most neglected. Uh, the issue in Washington is uh, that of how do you get things, and uh, how do you influence the government, and how you wield power. And uh, really, and basically, we only have two groups in Washington to deal with that we have problems with. And if we can handle those two groups, we have it made. And the way I see it, it's, uh, it's made up of conservatives and, and liberals. <laughs> Other than that, everybody's great, you know. And, uh, and there's only two parties that seem to have a problem in really understanding what's going on. You know, it's those Republicans and those Democrats. But, uh, but you know, there is a healthy sea change occurring. Yes. I, would, I would say that uh, we're starting to see a reflection of this. I always argue that the government that we have is a reflection of the people. And you say, boy, that's bad news. Look at what kind of government we have. What can we say about the people? Well, it's a slow, it's a slow uh, effort. That is, the people may change before Washington changes. And Washington's not doing badly, uh, considering the fact that on average, they're about 20 years behind the times. They're about 20 years behind the people. And, uh, but we're, we're seeing some catch up. And I think just two weeks ago we saw some catch up dealing with the very subject we're going to be spending some time on today, and that is the subject of the Patriot Act. And uh, this, was the, this was the amendment that came up to the House floor, amendment that I was a co-sponsor of, and that was to tone down the Patriot Act, to get rid of totally and completely the sneak and peek provision in the Patriot Act. Yeah. And we weren't sure whether we could get it to the floor because I was a co-sponsor of another amendment with Bernie Sanders who wanted to get rid of that portion of the bill that said that the FBI has the authority to go in and just start snooping at libraries and bookstores and just looking at all the lists in case they might find some information that would be worthwhile in their great effort to provide security for us. And uh, that was ruled out of order, and we fought and fumed with it, and uh, it looked like that would not be brought up. So when this subject of sneak and peek came up, 
uh, the, the, the lead on that was uh, Butch Otter from Idaho, and he had voted against, he was one of the very few Republicans that voted against the Patriot Act. There were three of us that voted against it. He had voted against it, so he's been very consistent on this issue. And I was the co-sponsor of that, and, uh, and, we, and we got it uh, to the floor. And we got a vote on it, but the amazing thing, not only did we win it, but we had over 300 members of Congress vote to weaken the Patriot Act and get rid of that provision. Now, it would be misleading if we were led to believe that uh, all of a sudden Congress is waking up, that they finally read the Constitution and they voted on principle. But they did wake up to the tune of hearing some voices, your voices. And that's the part that I am so amazed about. Not so much that there were some of us out there, but you know, doing this, uh, the job that I have in my own way for, for 20 years or more, you know, it, it comes around where you think, well, there aren't very many of us. So, and we don't have a great deal of influence in Washington, so therefore you say, yes, our numbers are growing, yes, I'm on radios and we get responses, yes, we have the internet, and, uh, but, but where, is the message really reaching? And I think this vote is a reflection of the fact that several things are happening. One, there are more of us than ever before, and the other fact is that we have better uh, means of communication. You know, we have the internet and radio and shortwave and newsletters and, and just so many more things available to us than 25 years ago when I first went to Washington. We had three major networks and that was it. So this is, this is good news. That doesn't mean to reassure you that uh, we're over the hump. This is just the bare beginning because the odds of that staying in the bill and the Senate passing it and the President signing it, very slim. And even if they did, do you think we could depend on them to follow the rules? There's no way. I mean, they, you know, there's one portion of the Patriot Act uh, that um, uh, Ashcroft argued for, and he still argues for. He says, we have to do this. And he said, uh, and somebody said, well, why do we have to have this radical change? He says, it's not so radical. He says, we've been doing that all along. We just want to put it into the law. <laughs> So uh, that's uh, generally the way it works. So I, I want to talk, of course, specifically about the Patriot Act, but more uh, about the attitudes in Washington and how it works and, and what, uh, what we're up against. First, it's a political attitude. Uh, the, the determination of individuals to go to Washington and do what they say. Have you ever had a member or a candidate come to you explaining their position and they sounded pretty good and then went to Washington and forgot what they told you? Has that ever happened? That was probably one of my early motivations to run for office was the fact that uh, too often we've been deceived. We can never agree on every issue. We can't have uh, unanimity on everything. But we should have agreement on sticking to our promises and doing our very best to obey, obey our oath of office, and that is to obey the Constitution. But the, uh, the politics of it is very important because depending on what their position is, uh, not only do we see people change after they go into office, have you ever seen some in office when they had had the opportunity to do some good? When they left, they became outstanding spokesmen for our policy but didn't do anything for us when they were in office. And sometimes people are congressmen and they, they'll say one thing and represent a district. Then they want to become a senator and all of a sudden their views change. And then you have somebody that wants a senator, he wants to run for president, and his views change again. So they're all over the place. Now I'm going to read a quote here from an individual. Some of you may have seen this. It was in one of my publications. And this is a quote from an individual when he was a senator. Sounds pretty good. Sounds like uh, I don't think many people in here will have too much objection with this. He said, the uh, Clinton administration would like the federal government to have the capability to read any international domestic computer communications. The FBI wants access to, dec uh, to decode, digest, and discuss financial transactions, personal emails, and proprietary information sent abroad, all in the name of national security. 
The administration's interest in all email is a wholly unhealthy precedent, especially given this administration, Clinton's administration, administration's track record on FBI files and IRS snooping. Every medium by which people communicate can be subject to exploitation by those with illegal intentions. Nevertheless, this is no reason to hand Big Brother the keys to unlock our email diaries, open our ATM records, and read our medical records or translate our international communications. The implications here are far-reaching, reaching with impact that touch individual users, companies, libraries, universities, teachers, and students. Does anybody disagree with that statement? That's a fear warning. That comes from none other than John Ashcroft. But now he's in charge. He has the power and all of a sudden his attitude is different. He will know how to handle the power and authority uh, much better than the Clinton administration. But maybe Wallace was right. Maybe there's not a dime's worth of difference. It's too bad we can't make him eat these words. That's what he needs to do. But he is, he is out on the campaign trail to drum up, drum up support for the Patriot Act. But he's also quite ready to pass Patriot Act number two which if you thought Patriot Act number one was bad, two is even worse. And under that one, they're going to be able to decide whether you're an American citizen or not. Yeah. And then if you're not an American citizen, oh, you might be in Guantanamo before you know it. So uh, this is serious business. But the impressive thing to me is that no average American, we have not been reading of dozens and dozens of cases where the knock on the door in the middle of the night and we've heard of people being hauled away and never seen before. It's not like that. And yet, the American people, uh, individuals like you in this room and many other tens of thousands of people have come to realize that if we're not careful, it could come to that. Bottom line, what we have, what we have developing is a corrupt government that is controlled by private financial interests that are driving forward using crises to enslave every man, woman, and child in America, and once we are totally enslaved, to use us as the cannon fodder for what Brzezinski, Brzezinski and Pienak and others have called imperial mobilization. They told us a 100-year war, it's never going to end. As the terrorist threat evolves, we'll have to take more and more liberties. These are all quotes. This is all admitted. Think about it. We've had a war on illiteracy. The test scores are dropping. We've had a war on drugs. There's triple the heroin, double the cocaine on our streets than what there was just 10 years ago. The prison population has more than quadrupled in the last five years. And there's more police, more checkpoints, more SWAT teams in ring wraith outfits kicking down doors and more cops and citizens getting killed as a result. Again, problem, reaction, solution. Over and over again, government uses crises to scare the population into submission. That is so important to understand. And it doesn't matter if Bill Clinton is in office or George W. Bush. They're just figureheads, puppets, marionettes dancing on a string. You follow those strings back to the dirty little corner, and there's a big fat spider sitting there. And yes, my friends, there really is an Illuminati. There really are 13 families. They own the big banks that print the money, and they have stated publicly that they plan to get all of us, that's 95 to 80 percent of us, out of the way to engineer a servant class and to totally take control of the evolutionary development of the human species. Now that's heavy stuff. Sounds like a science fiction movie. Science fiction movie 30, 40 years ago. We're in 2003. And whether I'm reading some CNN news story or Silicon Weekly or Bill Joy in Wired, they're bragging about how the elite 
is going to be the only group, the real elite. I don't mean the guy down the road that owns a million dollar house. I mean the real elite, the folks that own the banks that print the money. That's when you're wealthy. That's when you're powerful. That's when you're rich. That they are the only people that are going to have access to all of this undreamed technology that's been developed. So we're not just fighting old-fashioned tyranny here of the Babylonians or the Romans or Hitler or Stalin or Mao. We're fighting a push by a scientifically crafted dictatorship that is sworn to dehumanize you and your family. The country is getting poorer. There is no doubt in my mind. A lot of people are going to get poorer. They're going to get poorer because the country is poorer. And uh, they have exhausted now the, the tools that they have used traditionally since we've had our Federal Reserve especially in the last 30 or 40 years. The tools that they have used to get us out of recessions have always been fiscal stimulation. Government spend money. Run up the deficit, print more money. Well, this time around, they've been doing that, you know, uh, at excessive rates. Even early on, even before the recession hit, they were doing it. So what are they going to do in the old days if the recession was... You know, if they wanted to end the recession, interest rates were brought up high to dampen the economy, and interest rates would be high. Well, now, at the bottom of, of the recession, interest rates are at zero, one percent. Real interest rates are very, very low. So how can they lower them? How can we spend more money? You know, the national debt is going up right now over $700 billion per year. And about six or eight months ago, I thought I was making a very, very rash prediction and said, before too long, in the next several years, we're going to have the national debt, which includes the money you borrow from Social Security. The national debt is going to go up over a trillion dollars in one year. And I, I think that's going to be true. But there's going to be a limit to this. Eventually what happens, it runs out of steam, the dollar loses its value, interest rates go up anyway, which they have started to do. Inflation comes back, and you have inflation with recession and depression and the government can't function. But the real threat then is, will the momentum that uh, we have now, will it build? Will it pick up? Will we not have hundreds but thousands of people then recognizing what we have to do? And that is restore limited constitutional government to Washington. And I think what has happened to our country is that over the years, the prosperity, which was a consequence of our liberties, have become the dominant theme of everything that we do, whether it's local or national and politics. So it is the desire to get more and more wealth. And to get more and more wealth, you have to have more and more control of the government because the government controls so much of the wealth. So the concentration and the effort in Washington is 99% on preservation of wealth and what we're going to do, and very little concentration on the issues that we deal with, the preservation of liberty. If we concentrate and do our job and preserve liberty, we will never have to worry about our wealth. Okay, he asked if there's an international conspiracy to overthrow our government. The, the answer is yes, but probably not in exactly the terms that you're inferring, at least my understanding. I don't see, I can't go and say, well, I know the 25 people who meet and have made these plans, and this is what's going to happen. I think there are 25,000 individuals that have used Office of Hours. And they're in our universities, and they're in our congresses, and they believe in, in one world government. And uh, if you believe in one world government, uh, then you're talking about undermining national sovereignty, and you're talking about setting up something that you could very well call dictatorship. And those plans are there, but they're not quite, I don't see them as quite as sinister as a plot. I think it's a philosophic fight. They, they believe in this. Uh, the people I know believe in internationalism, the United Nations, and uh, a lot of it, some of those people who voted against the war didn't vote against the war because of uh, not having a declaration of war. They wanted more support from the United Nations. And uh, that attitude is prevailing because it's been taught so long in our public school system, as well as our universities, as, and, and uh, the people of great influence on, on our major new networks and uh, most positions in government, 
uh, support internationalism that would lead to that type Can of you problem. speak to the neocons of your, your, your speech you gave about the Trotsky, Machiavelli, and you? Yes, now the, uh, uh, the neocon speech I think is available here and it's uh, 20 or 30 pages, so I can't go over the, the whole thing, but the whole, the whole purpose of it was to try to point out the philosophic background to uh, those individuals who control our foreign policy. And a major part of it uh, was a, um, a, a critique of a book written by Michael Ledeen, who's one of the leaders of the conservatives, and uh, his work, he's at the uh, uh, American Enterprise Institute. And he, uh, he believes in all this stuff, except he only believes in the United Nations that the United Nations does what he wants it to do. But he's almost a militant nationalist, and he had written a book on Machiavelli and praise Machiavelli and, and, and really believe you should use these tools which are rather ruthless. So I took his quotes and answered many of his quotes and I only I quoted him literally uh, in order to try to keep it uh, you know, from getting too emotional. And um, the, uh, the interesting thing about this was uh, uh, he, called, he called me, he wrote emails and he also called my office, he was outraged. You know, by this, he wanted an apology and everything else, but uh, but he he praised uh, he was he high praise of Machiavelli. But the most interesting thing is, is that book had been, I had read it uh, I, had, I had read it about two or three years ago. I think it was 1999 when I read it when it came out, and it was handed out to us at a Republican strategy meeting. <laughs> and I read that, and it really. I went back and looked at it and said, oh, you know, when I was starting to put all these pieces together about who really got control of foreign policy uh, since 2001, and that he was this ringleader in it, then I went back and reread this book, and that's what uh, generally that book was about. Let me state this important facet of why we can't dig out of the mud, why we can't get out of this at this point right now. Because people are still in their Democrat and Republican camps. And you look at the people... You look at the people who control, who control the parties, and you look at their actions, open borders, gun control, more regulation, more taxation, arming our enemies, building up China and North Korea. You look at the real, the real actions of the Republicans and the Democrats, they are almost identical, almost identical. And so you've got the left and the right. I mean, I've told the so-called left, the bleeding heart, useful idiot left, you guys should love, absolutely love George Bush. The government's exploding in size at every level. He's expanding the Department of Education. He's signing on to the UN and UNESCO to take control of our educational processes. He says he'll sign the new assault weapons ban that's come up for reauthorization with a ban of all semi-automatic shotguns. Now that's in there, folks. You should, you should love Bush. You should just, he's wonderful. But see, oh no, he, that's horrible. He's, he, he's bad. He's one of those right-wing Christians. Folks, the guy goes to Skull and Bones. They put it on national TV. Oh, we caught this ritual on tape with him throat slitting and, 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 and doing ritualistic murders of women. They claim it's an effigy just like at Bohemian Grove. They put it on ABC News and Peter Jennings says, hey, they're just having fun. Then his old men, they go do it at the Grove with Arnold Schwarzenegger and the rest of them. I mean, this is incredible. I mean, look at Arnold Schwarzenegger. Democrats hate him. He's the great scourge. You should love him. Gun control, abortion on demand, wide open borders. He says he wants to raise taxes. Got Warren Buffett in there, the big kingmaker, uh, uh, George Schultz, all of them. See, there's no difference. I mean, I've been on so-called conservative talk shows, and they'll go, let me tell you something, buster. <laughs> If George Bush has got to compromise and ban semi-automatic shotguns, so be it. You got to work to get things done. I think you're working for the communists, boy. Not had him. I think you're working for the communists, boy. It's the same thing. Congressman Ron Paul did an absolutely amazing thing. He gave a speech on July 10th entitled Neo Con, where he said the Bush administration is run by Trotskyites, this is Ron Paul, organized criminals, corporate 
raiders and people that promote a system of, quote, entering into evil and a giant controlling welfare state. And this is where the left and right, that is, the establishment uh, types that think they're on the cutting edge of the false political spectrum, this is where they fall down. The left thinks we got to be nice, we got to get these rich people's money and help all these poor people. I mean, you know, that's the loving thing to do. And then the Republicans go, that's horrible, don't do that. Please don't throw me in the briar patch. You know that children's fable? The rabbit really wants to get thrown in the briar's patch. That's where he can run away and be safe. Oh, no, don't give us big government. The last thing we want is giant mechanisms of control to extract your wealth and, and to dominate you. That's the last thing we want. Big corporations are the biggest recipient of not just government uh, largesse and, and corporate welfare, you know, this, this uh, crony so-called capitalism, they are now being given governmental powers. And so the left screams, we ought to put this fire out, these evil right-wingers who aren't even right-wingers. You know, they're statists, they're command and controllers. There's no, there is no left or right. We got to put the fire out. Bring a truck of gasoline immediately and spray it directly on it. We got to get more air on this. And so as they clamor and jump up and down and, you know, fan the flames, it empowers this juggernaut. The government is nothing but a mechanism You've got the big central banks that took over last turn of the last century, sort of printing the money. They own the money machines that print the money. If a country doesn't accept their central banks, the enemy has been involved in terrorism. Giant attack fleets are landing to save them. The whole place is obliterated so the I'm of World Bank can come in and totally enslave the population and vaccinations can start and suddenly everybody's sterilized and all the kids have got autism and we're here to help you. The soldiers are all dying for depleting uranium and sarin and VX and the vaccines. The New World Order, you know, there's certain species of insects uh, that are laid into other living insects, larger insects, and the babies hatch out and eat the inside of it out and then break it open and fly off, and you just see this dead beetle, this husk laying there. That's what America is. We've got all these eggs in us. They're growing real fast. We're at death point. We're go the country's probably going to die, folks. We're at death point. They're eating us. The New World Order is going to bust out of that, using all our energy to set up the global empire, to smash and destroy and mini-nuke everyone. And then the UN, the EU can stand back and say, we are fighting against these evil right-wing Americans. When in reality, again, the creature that laid the eggs in us is sitting right over there in Europe. You understand this, folks? You understand this? And so it points at us. The system, the beast system points at America and goes, look at that beetle. It's spinning all over the place and going crazy and biting everyone. And then when they're done with us, the brood hatches out, total global domination, total enslavement of you and your family. And you'll have just, I mean, Bush is energizing the phony left wing. They're hatching out everywhere. They're going to totally take over. And don't think these leftists are going to care when you're getting drug off to a camp, having your guns taken. They're going to be cheating, going, finally we defeated them. Finally the UN came to America and stopped this fascist takeover. <laughs> it feels so good. Shut up. Shut up. We love the, the UN. And, and, and they'll use the UN up too. They said, fine, the UN isn't popular. We'll start some new global organization. Well, NATO is now global and it's going to be in Israel and Afghanistan and Iraq and, 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 and North Korea. And we take that over. <laughs> and oh, by the way, if you're not part of this glorious system, they'll just you know, blow something else up again and say, we've got to have a national draft of professionals too to work here domestically. It's going to be a draft where everyone serves. Yeah, domestically you can dig ditches or be an engineer or, you know, all the auxiliary time. It's compulsory volunteerism. You don't have to volunteer, but after the giant collapse of the banking system, it's the government that puts your 400 multi-pass creds onto the card each month. Fine, you don't want to volunteer. You just, we're all working, and so we're going to cut you off your card if you don't join in to pay for what goes on your multi-pass. They've already announced it. You're going to have four grades of ratings. If you have bad credit, you've got a second grade. You're not going to be able to fly unless you pay off the debts or at least sign up for a work program to pay them off. After all, we can't have these people, these people who were 18 and had hundreds of credit cards mailed to them on purpose. No, they never pay them back. Once you make money, they don't send you credit cards anymore. We can't have all these lazy people ripping off the credit card companies. It was so hard for the central bankers to add zeros and ones on the computer screens.
So I hope you're beginning to realize. I hope you're beginning to realize. At this point, folks, we've got to fight them as much as we can. Uh, they've laid the eggs, again, all in our torso. And they're already breaking out. Right now, the beetle's kind of going, what's going on here? Because they're, they're busting out right now. Now they're starting to feed. There could be an emergency surgery of some type if enough powerful people weren't totally sold out and decadent to remove them. The country's still badly damaged and would, uh, I don't know if it could survive. But we can prepare for the crash landing. And we can work our tails off to inform and educate people so that as the globalists bring us more terror and more wars to get us behind supporting their system, more resistance will form and then you will see the defeat of this current phase of evil. There's always going to be another phase of evil that the next generation is going to have to contend with. But this is really for all the marbles. If the globalists win now, if they get their agenda through now, they have stated that they are going to begin accelerated mass extermination programs. I mean, folks, there are Library of Congress published, declassified, 1993, hundred page reports with Henry Kissinger's name on it, where they made deals with the third world. You want IMF and World Bank money? You gotta force and sterilize half your women before we give you the money. I mean, they've already been doing stuff like that for years. Millions of men in India, police just drive by, grab you, put you in a truck, cut, cut their testicles off. They don't even do, you know, cut the tubes. We had over 400,000 women in this country grabbed by CPS and health departments, federally funded, up until the 1980s and taken off to have their uteruses removed. A lot of times they would have, oh, it gets worse, they would have medical students do it. I mean, this stuff's already been going on for a long time. You haven't felt the brunt of it in this country yet. You are. Because the system is hatching its young for the next phase. And out of that crisis, they're bringing us, they're again going to set us all up for imperial mobilization to work as slaves in the, in the crown jewel of the New World Order Empire. And America will be absorbed and its energies refocused to complete this circle of wickedness. But again, think about how far we've already slid. The American Bar Association comes out and says, lawyers are going to spy on you. By law, they're going to have to tell the judge and the prosecutor everything about you, and, but they don't have to tell you. And by the way, we're not going to let people represent themselves because well, they keep winning all their cases and having a better track record and, and well we're a private uh, monopoly again out of London, England and we're going to make you do that. Here's another one. Your cell phone is now a tracking device and uh, this particular uh, story is out of the Green Bay News paper and the reason it's interesting is it says yeah in 2001 they passed a law that all new cell phones, well the law was passed in 96, it, it activated October 1st 2001, five years later that all new cell phones have to be satellite trackable. That is, there's GPS in the cell towers. They triangulate your cell phone and follow you, even when it's off. And they said, well, the governor, uh, Doyle, got together with Homeland Security, and we don't just need the feds to be able to monitor this. We need the local police to have a tracking system for everyone just to keep track. We punch your, your, your code in, Social Security in, and you got a cell phone. It pops up where you're at, even when your phone's off. I mean, imagine trying to tell this to somebody 10 years ago that, well, well there's going to be a big, giant federal office uh, that's secret, and it's going to watch you as you drive around with your cell phone or in your car. And then they go on in these articles to say, by the way, the government also had a feature put in, it wasn't really mentioned back in 1996 when it was passed, that they need to be able to covertly turn your phone on and listen to you while you got it. But again, it's to stop terrorists. We passed it many years before the terrorists, but we said the terrorists were coming. And, you know, this would all be needed. Here's another one out of the BBC. Spy plans for new cars. And I remember about eight years ago, a listener sent me a truck driving magazine. It was how great it was. All the new cars, big rigs are going to have this. We're going to track you and tax you a little bit. But it gives you more service. And it's going to be a wonderful thing. And then I, about four years ago, had this uh, Wisconsin uh, uh, state uh, congressman on. 
Remember the legislature? He said, yeah, I'm on a federal board. I want to warn everybody. The CMN News article got him on. He said, I want to warn everybody. I've been in the federal board meetings. Within five years, they're going to be taxing all of us, drive our cars and regulate us. This is horrible. They're going to track us with them. And the guy sent me a cool copy of the federal plan. I had it right there, and I was warning everybody they're going to do this. And people call her on the street. Oh, Alex, you've gone too far. They're not. There's no way they'd get away with that in America. There's no way they'd be able to get away with that. I'm not going to put up with it. And then Oregon comes out and goes, we've been involved the last five years in a federal study, and we want to, uh, by uh, 2004, to make everybody be taxed to drive their cars. And just so happens, the Associated Press reported, that five, six years ago, all new cars had to have the plug-ins in the ignition for the satellite tracker box in them. So it's a $25 unit, and you just go in and pay for it when you get it, buy a lot to get your tags, and we just track in, track shit, and look, if you get a fuel-efficient car, it's not going to cost that much. Just a few cents a mile peak times. You've got an SUV, it is going to be 60 cents a mile. They, they said this. And, and so they're softening us all up, another divide-and-conquer thing. Look at them with their big cars, you know, some petty, low-level, uh, class-envy stuff to sell that next wave to you. And, I mean, I'm looking at it right here. Spy plans for new cars. And uh, they say not only is it a satellite tracker system, and Canada's starting this, the U.S. is starting this, it's all, Germany just made it the law. They're phasing in over the next five years to make it, you know, all new drivers have to have it. And then in four years, everyone has to get it, you know, five years. They're always really good at that. Again, they understand the mindset of a mammal that, well, yeah, I did see a lion back over there about a mile away, but he's over there eating somebody else right now. It's being, <laughs> it's being phased in. Oh, we don't have a chance to run. We're in a pen with these people. We've still got some small projectile weapons, which they're kind of worried about. We'll have massive attrition with our stormtroopers if we attempt that move at this point. It could then be a backlash to it as the enemy has victories. No. No, we can, we can brainwash them and let them keep their guns, and then a tiny fraction will resist. By then it'll be too late. And as Josh Sugarman said from the Violence Policy Center, we've already got your kids. We will ban all guns. So it's very serious. I mean, and, and I predicted years ago, again, once you know these people, it's not hard to know their, their plan, that they would have Hollywood people and, 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 and rich people take microchips. And so you see them all over the news, how wonderful microchips are and how we all need microchips. And, oh, this Hollywood person is getting one for their, their child or daughter. And, oh, look at the family, the, uh, you know, the chips. And they're so cool. Everybody's got to have it. You know, the same newscast in the same order on every channel saying the same thing, word for word, often an often admitted script. You're watching daytime TV dramas, you know, uh, or, uh, or, or cop shows. Man, we wouldn't have, that kid wouldn't have gotten kidnapped if he just had the Applied Digital Solutions chip. <laughs> well, here's one out of the Herald Sun. You may have heard of this. Microchip to watch Prince Harry. Prince Harry to be fitted with a surveillance microchip during his year-long holiday in Australia. It, it's to be implanted under the skin for his safety. See? Wow. Man, you got to be, that's a major status symbol. It's like the satellite tracking. Ooh, I have OnStar, I have OnStar. Uh, it's, it's a status symbol. You need to have them remove that if you buy a Chevy vehicle, because now it's standard on all the new ones. And that's the same federal package. Ford's announcing to make GPS standard. See, oh, it's standard, and by the way, there's a tax, and by the way, we set this up five, six years ago. See the premeditated nature of it? See how it's, they build the infrastructure and then put us into it? I remember four years ago being on the radio and going, Here's the Army War College document. Here is the public plan. They're talking about hive minds connecting us all in by law with microchips in our brains by 2025. The Army War College brags how they'll use the media and hype and peer pressure to get the people to accept what they would have never accepted without the brainwashing, the conditioning. And people go, man, you flipped out. I can't believe that. And I put a link on my website to the Army's website, you know, dot mil. And they go, I can't believe they're saying that. The Army's job is going to be implanting every citizen with their own chip? But they actually said that. And then everybody saw on the news the last two years after the terror attack, they suddenly played up child kidnappings that were actually way down. But they played them. They played them way up and said, what's the answer? And suddenly on every network at the same time, microchips, implantable microchips to track and trace you. I mean, this stuff sounds crazy, but you have all seen it on the news. You've all seen the unified propaganda, the systematic crafting, the same phrases, whole paragraphs on different networks, ex spoken exactly the same. And see, that goes into the nature of the staged events. The, 
They're calling it a Patriot Act debate nationwide. Ashcroft's hearing your concerns. They, they drive the guy in secretly to the hotel where he gives a speech. No one is allowed in. They frisk the media. Only allow certain members of the media to ask questions. This has all been admitted. I mean, it's like Bush up in... Uh, up there for uh, you know how great made in America is, how much good American made things we have, how good the economy is up in St. Louis earlier this year with all the made in America USA sprayed on the boxes yeah. and they zoomed in, it's all made in China. None of it was made here, but it was, just, it was just an illusion. Secret Service told them in Indianapolis, Indiana a couple months ago, all right, everybody, President's about to be here. Take your ties off or you can't be in here. Thousands of people. And they went, some people said, well, I'm taking my tie off. Secret Service threw them out. That's your free country. You go hear the president speak, and you know it's all. Let's have the let's have uh, everybody from the weapons plants come. It, you know it's already a controlled mass there, and so the crowd from the weapons plant comes in to you know to watch the president. They're already all for weapons sales and everything. So oh, this is a good crowd. But then they're told take your ties off because they want to have the view that you know we're blue collar. We're not wearing ties. My point is I could talk for hours about that. It's totally staged. It isn't liberal bias or conservative bias. See, they know that your minds are somewhat sophisticated. So they will create layers of, oh, you peeled that layer back. You found out it was a liberal bias. Oh, you peeled that, labor, that uh, layer back. It was a neocon bias. Oh, you peeled that layer back. It was a big government bias. No. It's a, again, scientifically crafted warfare system. And even before they were... You know, coming out with all the microchips, telling us how good all the implanted microchips would be, they said, watch kooks that talk about implantable chips and all these nuts that talk about urban warfare training and black helicopters. And all of a sudden, years before they launched all the helicopters on us and the raids and the training to get us ready to get rid of posse comitatus, the 1878 law that uh, bans the military from engaging in law enforcement activities, they would say, crazy people talk about black helicopters. It's a code word for absolute evil. And then when the helicopters and the urban warfare training hit Texas and the rest of the country and they were blowing up buildings in front of people and terrorizing the population, Czechoslovakian troops running around, they went, of course, we're just doing some training to get our military ready. And uh, yeah, black helicopters exist. But still, people that warn the public about black helicopters, kind of this, you know, this, this icon or symbol for urban warfare uh, training, conditioning, they go, but you're still weird to talk about them. You're still weird to talk about implantable microchips. You're that weird guy who talks about all that weird stuff. I'm like, why isn't it weird when it's on the news? Right. See? So that's built-in defense mechanisms where people don't want to face a threat. So they want to just deny what you're saying. They want to deny what you've told them. They don't want to believe it. Everything's been made so, so comfortable for us here while they euthanize the human spirit. Here's one out of Television Week. We posted this on InfoWars.com. Television Week. Big magazine. Industry magazine. It says, is your television watching you? Television Week. Could the federal government find out what you're watching on TV even if you're not the subject of criminal investigation? The answer is yes, according to legal experts and industry officials. Under the USA Patriot Act, this stuff, they built this infrastructure. They had it all lined up. Go day, go day. Building it, building it, building it to launch the primer that was September 11th to roll us into the next phase. I mean, this is diabolical. They're on a plan, and we have derailed it. Make no mistake, we would have already seen more huge catastrophic attacks, not the little pinpricks just to remind us of the terror. If, if you wouldn't have been out there involved speaking out, writing books, putting up websites, doing radio interviews, calling into talk shows, telling people at church what's going on, making copies of videotapes. If you wouldn't have been doing that, believe me, they'd already be blowing stuff up. Amen. They'd be launching more anthrax attacks. They were, the big CFR guy who kind of runs the terror operation for the government, makes little terror announcements, the Hart Rudman Commission, Gary Hart, he got up on TV middle of last year and he said there will be smallpox attacks in Denver, Dallas, and Cleveland, and you better give all your rights up. I mean, he said it. He said, you better... He said, you just get ready for it. We're going to lock all the cities down. They had the head of FEMA, Mike Van Winkle, up in, uh, up in uh, New Jersey, say in uh, the uh, newspaper, in the Gannett News Service, that, hey, under a red alert, you can't leave your house. You'll be considered an enemy combatant if you leave your home. The Army, they had one of their colonels 
uh, in the uh, Detroit Free Press, he said, we'll shoot grandmothers if they try to run quarantine. And you look at what Bush is doing, he's building three dozen giant, what he calls bio-shield, level four bio-weapons plants. Baltimore Sun said they're going to produce thousands of gallons of liquid death of weaponized smallpox, weaponized Ebola. And they're just doing it right out in front. The terrorists are about to strike us. The terrorists are about to strike us. And they're building all these giant plants to just, and in, and in big cities and small towns, three dozen of them. I mean, they're a hundred times more dangerous than a nuclear weapons production plant or nuclear reactor. And have you heard about this on the news? Very little. So your television watching you. And then I've got the new Victory Act. What, what this is is a duplication of Patriot Act 1 and 2. Because parts of Patriot Act 1 have been repealed in the House. It's now in the Senate. And so they're trying to duplicate it. Again, they shoot a torpedo at the country. We might, you know, it might hit the ship in a spot where the bulkhead's reinforced and only floods a few compartments. Well, they're not going to stop. Torpedo 2, torpedo 3, torpedo 4, torpedo 5. That's what they're doing right now. I've, I've, I'm writing analysis of the Victory Act. It says in here, the Victory Act says that possession of any controlled substance or prohibited substance, that means a little old lady puts her medication in the wrong plastic container when she goes to church. And who doesn't do that? Who's on medica who takes medication? You've all heard of people, little old ladies getting taken to jail. Cop pulls over. Let me search. Let's share off the knife. What are these pills? These aren't the designated bottle. Under that, it says one marijuana cigarette. Anything. 20 to life. It says it. It says it in the Victory Act. Word for word. And it says it's an act of terrorism. And before they announced this, this evil law, before Ashcroft went on his ridiculous Carnival Barker road show, before they did that, they had all the TV ads. Well, I occasionally smoke marijuana, and I don't see how it helps terrorists. And then the Guy goes, you know, the intellectual goes, let me list a hundred reasons. And at the end, the guy's going, <laughs> and, and then the <laughs> ad fades to black, like, oh, I've been decimated. See, they tell you, marijuana is eating Al-Qaeda. And then, <laughs> and then you, you see all these ads on TV, public service announcement, brought to you by Homeland Security, or brought to you by all their little minion groups, all the little 501c3 charities. And so they do that. That's what they're up to. This is their operation. So they're just fire, and, and people go, well, we've been beating back the first Patriot Act and educating a lot of folks, but they're bringing out more than nothing we can do. You're in a war, folks. They're firing more torpedoes. That should encourage you. These guys. <laughs> arming enemies, arming terrorists. There are as many examples of this as there are fish in a good-sized lake. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Here's one, Time Magazine, and they just admit this now. Nukes to North Korea from Nashville. And it says, yeah, these conservative groups that own these big weapons companies, they've been selling all the nuke stuff to Kim Jong-il in North Korea, and now we're going to have to have World War III to fix it. Well, that's all right. But we had to go in there and get Saddam, man. He had some aluminum tubing. You know, my gosh, that guy, he was in bombed out bunkers. He was a real threat. Of course, he also had about $4 trillion in oil, and a bunch of weapons sales, and got the troops in that region, invade Syria, Iran, everybody else. So there's that. And there's idealistic Philippine rebellion leaders claim moral victory. This was all over the BBC and the French news. And uh, 300 commandos led by a colonel. Uh, took over a building, r released documents, and said the government with the U.S. has been doing all the bombings, shooting all the people. It's our own government shooting us. There are no terrorists here. The Muslims are doing nothing. These, these so-called terror groups are the Philippine government, quote, that wants to continue martial law. It's been in effect there for decades. I mean, it's simple. Let's say I owned uh, the company that sold uh, fire department equipment, and I wanted to make some money. I'd go out and set fire to something out here in Bastrop, and then I'd, oh, I see, I told you you should have bought my firefighting equipment. I mean, it's not hard to figure this out. Here's another one. U.S. Pakistan made deal over capture of bin Laden. That's out of the mainstream India. And uh, Musarif's over there, the head of India, I mean, the head of Pakistan next door to India, who are all threatening to nuke each other, and they're saying, well, yeah, we could have got bin Laden, but we just didn't. That would have caused some problems. 
But, and they flew 8,000, it's not 6,000 now, 8,000 Taliban and Al-Qaeda out to safety in the middle of the phony war. All opposition fell apart. They flew them out to safety, admit the U.S. government did it, and Fox News said, well, it's true, but it was an accident. You're going to talk bad about our C-130 pilots? They didn't mean it. And there's the Pentagon there, admittedly, with large groups of euros and dollars and gold. Some news articles paying them. Good job, men, good job. You know, they go in, act cool, shoot some stuff up. They were put in by the globalists. Then they have this big phony war. They collapse and fall back, and the globalists take over that country in a month that the Russians couldn't do in eight, nine years. It's all staged, folks. And they've got more wars. They say a hundred-year war. They say that it's never going to end. And the war is now against people that smoke marijuana. Not against Riddle or Prozac users, though. The uh, war is now against people that don't turn over their property to the government. Uh, there's a stuff in the Victory Act about protesting or standing up for your land when they're taking it, and, and uh, you're a terrorist. I mean, this, all this legislation turns us into serfs, slaves. You tell somebody this, though, they go, that's ridiculous. Government would never do anything wrong or want to control us. Oh, no, just all throughout human history, six plus thousand years of civilization, that's all they ever tried to do. But, but now they're all nice and sweet. <laughs> By the way, guys in black ski masks were always bad guys. People in black ski masks, you know, oh, that's the terrorist, that's the bank robber. About five years ago, Hollywood, the news, hey, you know, all cops look like this, it's cool, they're the good guys. You know, every department, well, i got to have my own combat boots and my own ski mask, my own black helmet, and somebody's door to kick down. Man, that's, that's cool. But the good news is that John Ashcroft has been trying to go around the country and have these staged town hall meetings where they only allow police and government employees in. And in Detroit, he got up this week and began giving a speech, and at the end of it, a man stood up and said, Mr. Ashcroft, I would like to know which of your terrorists are going to be used for a new 911. You and Vice President Dick Cheney, said the heckler who got into the room in a downtown De Detroit convention center by posing as a TV reporter. These people... These people shouldn't be able to go anywhere in public where they're out peddling their lives without being confronted by you, we the people. And I've covered these protests. I've had guests on in the middle of them in, in, in Detroit, in uh, Salt Lake City, in Boise. And you'll have 500 people, 1,000 people, 200 people. Black people, white people, Hispanics, old, young, conservatives, liberals, and they're all there, they're waking up. And if you just tell the truth about tyranny and explain how things really work and how corrupt and dangerous this out of control, privatized government is, how they created a big government, got us all addicted, privatized it, and they're handing it over to the corporations with new governmental power, man, the little socialists I know are going out and buying guns. It's beautiful. <laughs> if you're not a hypocrite, you can be programmed and, and go, wait a minute, did, did a Native American have a right to have a gun to defend themselves? Against the army? Well, of course, of course. Well, you like Che Guevara so much, I don't agree with him. He was an establishment guy, but, uh, you know, I see you wearing a T-shirt with him with an AK-47. Why is that okay? See, you've just got an opinion that isn't backed up with any fact. And it's a recipe for disaster to disarm a population. You disarm a population. Let's say we had a little angel running the government right now. When you do get a dictator, they're going to be able to go all the way. And that's what the separation of powers are about. That's what the Bill of Rights is about. It's all about restraining power. Realize that history does repeat itself. And emperors and kings and despots and strong men and king rats have always used crises, the threat of the unknown, of the enemy, of the criminal, the low-level criminal, to convince the mass to relinquish control of their lives and to serve and become willing slaves of the system. This system is un-American. It's anti-human, it's anti-God, it's degenerate to its very, very core. And you are part of history in your fight against it. You are special, you do matter, you are leaders. So get in the bleeding heart liberal idiots' faces, the mindless neocons, get in these people's faces and wake them up that we are under a massive sustained terrorist attack by the New World Order military industrial complex and that they're attempting to expand that control. Again, thank you so much for coming and God bless you all.
Thanks for watching this presentation of The Matrix of Evil. All these different diverse minds coming to you with the same conclusion. World government, tyranny. It's up to you to become a leader. If you want to reach people, you first have to be informed. And one of the key areas of the New World Order agenda is government-sponsored terror, where the government carries out terror attacks and then blames it on their political enemies. And this is going on from Germany to Japan to the United States to Israel. And in my book, 9-11, Descent into Tyranny, I detail the history of government-sponsored terror. We focus in on Oklahoma City and September 11 and show how they're using that as an excuse to expand their police state. I've also published another book by Paul Watson, Order Out of Chaos, Elite-Sponsored Terror and the New World Order. This book, in over 300 pages, lays out the facts of government-sponsored terror. It proves that the New World Order carried out September 11th and most other major terrorist attacks, and then again, use those events to scare the population into accepting tyranny. One of the best videos I've produced of the 10 I've made over the last six years is Police State 3 Total Enslavement. You want to wake people up? This is one of the key tools that we offer. It covers what the New World Order is, the history of it, the PNAC prior knowledge of September 11th, the attack on liberties through Patriot Act 1 and 2, Homeland Security, Ashcroft's lies, government-run white slavery rings that are admitted in the mainstream media as one of their largest industries after drug trafficking. We get into gun control, forced inoculations, foreign troops, concentration camps, the casual society control grid. Police State 3 Total Enslavement, folks, is an incredible film if you want to truly be informed about our world today and be educated so you can inform others and be a leader in your community. And then, of course, I produced 9-11, The Road to Tyranny, covering September 11th and government-sponsored terror, along the same lines of the book, 9-1-1, Descent to Tyranny. Part two of my 9-11 film and book is The Masters of Terror Exposed. And uh, this film just continues with hundreds of smoking guns and red flags proving that the military-industrial complex carried out September 11th. So again, please visit InfoWars.com or PrisonPlanet.com and our secure online shopping cart and buy these books and videos and share them with your friends and family. Or you can simply call toll-free 1-888-253-3139 or write to us at the address that we're going to put on the screen. Number one, these videos and books are powerful tools to wake people up. 90% of those that see these documentaries are beginning to awaken. Because the New World Order agenda is so far along now, they're very perceptive to the truth. They already instinctively know that something's wrong. And secondarily, purchasing these films and books also supports our ministry and what we're doing to unlock minds, to free minds out there, to, to, to shatter the controlled paradigms and attempt to resist this dehumanizing force that is neo-serfdom. Again, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your support. God bless you.